game, they're definitely going to be doing this. It's much easier to do uh, more behavioral um, behavioral type responses. Uh, we also are curious in terms of who people blame. Uh, I'm hearing myself here, but um, and and uh, it is striking that although Russia is the, is the most notable source, um, large energy, energy uh, large oil and gas companies, but even you know UK green policies. Other, so the, again, dep partly depending upon your you know, political ideology, your 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 views of many other things, it, it will kind of explain why you might find other forces besides. You know the actual invasion of Russia uh, to be responsible. Can I turn this down? If I can not hear myself. Is that okay? If I turn that down, great. Um, um, uh, the the other thing that is also striking um, uh, is is you know and it partly explains why, for example, people tend to beat up on on energy companies uh, because when we ask people what do they think is kind of responsible for the, the kind of, or how, how do they think their costs are, are divvied up? Um, something like people think that on average, close to a quarter of their bill goes to company profits. And so if you think that a quarter of your bill goes to company profits, it's not surprising that you're blaming the energy companies for, um, uh, for, for the cost of living um, crisis. You know, this contrasts with the actual numbers uh, for, you know, that off-gen would supply, which is, you know, typically it was about one to 2%. Uh, that, that's the utilities. Obviously, uh, there's a question of how much of, you know, oil and gas companies gain from, from uh, the, um, uh, the costs of, of um, you know, the wholesale costs. Um, the, the other thing I, I wanted to kind of focus on here was, was how do people respond then? Right, so they're faced with this crisis, um, and and um, I'll show you the numbers both for kind of the first survey we did in March, and and then uh, the, the later survey in, in um, November when some of the policy uh, frameworks were were kind of more clearly um, defined. But but it is striking how a lot of fairly radical solutions that aren't even particularly being considered by governments uh, are are um, quite uh, quite popular. So. Um, you know, the, the idea of nationalizing um, energy companies, not surprisingly, it's most popular amongst uh, uh, conservative uh, voters, say, uh, sorry, labor voters, rather, um, uh, you know, something like 30-40% uh, of the, the, the overall public uh, would favor nationalizing energy companies. And as I said, it's most, you know, mostly labor voters, but actually a significant number of conservatives would support this. Uh, wholesale tax, uh, a windfall tax on oil and gas companies, even at a time that the previous governments, plural, uh, were not were not uh, uh, supporting this. Uh, uh, kind of a large majority of the British public were very supportive of of having a windfall tax on on oil and gas companies. Uh, doing other things like breaking up the energy companies, uh, rolling back green levies. Again, they're not the same people, right? Just because you get 30%. In some cases, these are kind of further right-wing uh, uh, voters who would support uh, green levies as a way of cutting back on costs, whereas in other cases, you know, the nationalization would be kind of more left-wing um, type uh, type voters. And kind of a range of proposals that um, fairly, I would say, tepid proposals that um, the then uh, chancellor, current prime minister had, uh, like uh, uh, which would, didn't go over very well, like this 200 pound upfront loan that was meant to be paid back gradually that that people really didn't uh, like, for example. Um, and and again, not surprisingly, some of the things that we have been doing for many years, like the warm uh, home discount uh, and winter fuel payments were were very were very popular. Um, this is just the up, updated version from from uh, November when many of these policies uh, came through. Um, so the energy price guarantee, you know, I would say vastly expensive way of spending um, tens of billions of pounds, uh, but but also very popular, right? Very popular in terms of of, of um, the average voter, both labor and conservative voters, kind of the vast majority of, of left and right like this idea of uh, energy price um, a guarantee. Um, uh, so so it is striking that that, that would well but what maybe is more surprising and again as somebody who'd say well could government not at least do an advertising campaign do something to try and get people to change their behavior actually 
that is much less popular. Um, the, 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 that I kind of, there's, I think that's still the idea of nanny state and concerns over government intervention. And the, the other way was thinking about mandatory energy saving measures. Um, these would be much more, you know, better use of, of our taxpayer funds, um, much better way of addressing some of these problems are not nearly so popular and, and get a fair bit of opposition, whereas, you know, spending 100 billion pounds seems to generate virtually no opposition, which is interesting as, <laughs> as a policy analyst. Um, as I said, this is funded through the UK CCS Research Center. So we've been asking questions about CCS for many years. It is striking how, how consistent these results are. And, um, and it, it's also worth remembering, these are always going to be upper estimate, upper bound estimates, right? Nobody likes admitting they don't know something. So, so the, the numbers you should be skeptical about are the, you know, three, four percent that say they're very familiar with CCS. They're likely to be, you know, that's likely to be somewhat exaggerated. You know, they once read an article about it, so you're now very familiar. Um, so, so again, it is striking just how, how consistent it is. We're having a, you know, we think we're making progress. We think we're more people are turning up at, at conferences and so on. Uh, but but from the public's perspective, um, it is completely under um, uh, un unobserved, really. Um, and then and then finally, I just wanted to end going through. Uh, we we ask how people would respond to um, uh, you know constructing a net zero portfolio. So what what would what should go into that uh, to address uh, to address climate change? And again, we track it over over many years and. Um, gas CCS um, is, you know, gets slightly more support than it does opposition. But again, lots of people, not surprisingly, if if uh, a significant fraction of the British public hasn't heard of CCS, it's then striking that so many people are actually even willing to give any sort of a response. Um, uh, but but again, gas CCS a little bit more popular. Coal CCS a little bit less popular than than gas. Um, Bex um, uh, a little bit more popular than than gas. Again, none of these terribly um, <laughs> terribly well valued, terribly um, preferred. Um, uh, direct air capture, which is again again started to get a little bit more attention in, amongst the public, uh, uh, still not terribly um, uh, terribly popular, uh, fairly consistently. Um, enhanced weathering. Um, maybe we'll hear more later. Uh, again, also relatively low levels of support. More people tend to um, uh, oppose the oppose this than than support it. Uh, nuclear energy, again, longstanding uh, <laughs> divergence of opinion, but striking that the UK, unlike many other European countries, um, the majority actually are supportive of of, of using um, uh, nuclear energy. Uh, wind. Very supportive. Lots of Tory voters support this, regardless of what they'll, they'll tell you. But but um, uh, very, relatively few people oppose um, solar energy. Even stronger support, even less um, even less opposition. And then I finally wanted to end just a couple of geoengineering examples. Uh, and all we do is give people a sentence on it. But but it is striking how there's some things that people actually are much more strongly opposed to than CCS. And so. Um, uh, the the something like ocean iron fertilization and particularly um, putting aerosols up into the um, uh, up into the stratosphere get really kind of negative uh, negative views. Okay, um, probably end there since I'm probably at looking for Mathieu. I've lost. There we go. Is I'm at time. Okay, sure. Uh, so just to and just to say, people also don't know what CCS does. So so um, there we go. So I'll end there and uh, hand it over. Um, I guess we can do questions now, yeah? Yes, yes. do people know about it? Oh, sorry. Um, your CCS, do people know about it graph? What, what did you ask them? Did you just say, have you heard of, are you familiar with carbon capture storage or did you kind of describe the process a little bit? Yeah, no, so we did describe 
for, for the question where we're asking about the portfolio, we give a single um, sentence to describe each of them, right? Simply. But but we, earlier in the survey, we asked them, have you, um, you know, ha have you heard about carbon capture or storage? Yeah. So no, no one. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, Joey Scarf, Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. Uh, are you doing any research where you think or where you get the participants to think about the portfolio and the trade-offs? So when you ask one question about would you have this in your portfolio, it gives quite interesting results. But also if you force them to think about, you know, would you have gas CCS or would you be happy to turn off your washing machine at times of high demand? then helping them make those trade-offs and understanding people's perceptions to that would be quite interesting. Yeah. You know, this, this is a 20 minute survey. Uh, so obviously I think you're limited. Okay. Otherwise we have done things like, um, you know, citizens juries up in Scotland that we try to make, spend more time with public and the others. Um, lots, lots of this sort of work. Um, I, I think to, to really draw out those trade-offs, I think you want to have kind of more, you know, kind of deeper engagement uh, with probably smaller groups. I, mean, I was involved in the, the science-wise yeah. study in Bayes. I did that yeah, similarly that, that did this on, on a cluster, you know, kind of regional basis. And, and I think that's an opportunity where you can explore those trade-offs a bit more. Thanks, David. It's really interesting to see that progress over the, the years. Oh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, or not. Um, it was just, again, a question for cl of clarification. Um, is it the same group or the same split of demographic that you're using every time? Or I, I'm just wondering if you saw different responses from older people or younger people. Okay. One is that but it's a different sample of two thousand. Um, so, but it's meant to be representative of the British public. Um, but, but what is striking is how consistent those numbers can be, even though you're picking a different sample of two thousand each time, which gives you a little bit more confidence in results. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay. Yeah, I have a question. I mean, I assume that when you ask them or when you present the portfolio, they can say like no to each option, right? How would it look like, or have you ever done it that you said, this is the portfolio and in order to get somewhere, we would have to at least choose one or two options and which ones would you prefer and how would that change their response? Do you say one way to do it would be to choose one or two you know, force them to add things up to 100. Uh, and that would, uh, we have to have similar things. Um, but, but yeah, I think that, that, that's really important. I mean, I think there's a bit of get that. Technologies as opposed to uh, the portfolio of the board. So Rob Bellamy's got a 2023 paper on that. Yeah, well, thank you very much, David. Uh, maybe you can join me and uh, give David a quick round of applause. Our next speaker is uh, Darmi Cleary, who's a research associate at the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research uh, in Manchester. Um, and he's got a PhD in the technical aspects of greenhouse gas removal at the University of Leeds. He now works as part of IDRIC, uh, working with stakeholders from CCS Cluster and the UK public to establish a social license for industrial decarbonization. He previously worked as an engineer in the energy industry, and he's going to tell you about his research. All right, floor's yours, David. Yeah, I'll, I'll use this as soon as it worked last time. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Diamond. I'm at the Tyndall Center at the University of Manchester, uh, and there I work with Claire Goff, who's the PI on this project, who unfortunately couldn't make the conference. Um, I'm going to be talking today about building a social license to operate in um, UK clusters. This work is focused on 
two clusters, so the Northwest cluster and the Humber cluster is where we're studying, um, but hopefully it'll be applicable to um, other clusters in the UK. And uh, we are part of IDRIC, which is the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we call it IDRIC, uh, but it builds on work uh, funded by the UK CCS RC. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so before we get into it, um, we thought it'd be useful to define what a, a social license cooperate is. Um, so as part of defining that, a kind of high level of um, support for, for projects or technologies that are associated with uh, decarbonization. It's very ongoing, it's kind of dynamic, it'll be moving um, and it's uh, context specific. So it will be different in each region and it's influenced by events. So it, it's very much changing. Um, as part of that, approaches must be perceived as kind of being credible, legitimate and trusted. And by that, we mean um, that it will deliver industri industrial decarbonization. So essentially uh, reducing emissions is important, uh, but it's also being perceived um, by the mix of stakeholders that are involved in these cluster plans as being the right way to do things. Um, as part of that, we kind of mean the shared understanding, uh, the involvement from, from all these stakeholders. And we kind of see um, at the bottom there, the different stakeholders that are involved. So communities, uh, the developers, regulators, decision makers, um, they're all feeding into that. And they're all the kind of people that we try to tap into as, as part of this work to get their opinions. Um, and yeah, the trust must, is important between those stakeholders um, across the different scales. Uh, so to try and define a social license a little bit um, better, uh, this pyramid model of a social license we, we find to be quite useful. So um, often in this kind of field, we can kind of uh, talk about public acceptance um, and we're trying to build on that. So it's not just acceptance. Um, obviously at the bottom there, you've got in red, ultimately a project could be um, uh, rejected or um, permission kind of withheld. Uh, that's obviously what we don't want. Uh, a lot of talk about acceptance where we might perceive these projects, technologies being um, accepted, but that might be kind of putting up with the projects maybe. They kind of see the downsides, uh, they accept those, um, but we're hoping to kind of get towards the top of this where people actually like the technologies, have pride in them. Uh, that's a strong social license to operate um, where they want it to happen in their region and they're proud of it. Um, so as part of the work that was has previously been done by, by Claire and um, Sarah Amanda at the University of Manchester, uh, this work was kind of funded by the UK CCS. Um, we've kind of developed this idea of um, this this structure here, where uh, it, it's things thinking about things that contribute towards a, a social license. So at the bottom of of this pillar diagram, um, as Matthew said, I was an engineer by background, so you start at the bottom, you lay your foundations, and that's the context of of what happens in the region. Uh, lots of things feed into that kind of historical projects that may have failed, um, what's happened in the region previously, the kind of political landscape, um, all of those things will, will feed into the context uh, for um, a social license in that region. Um, and then the kind of pillars going up are the things that feed into uh, a social license at different scales. So we've got stakeholder networks, um, communicating and learning, uh, the different narratives that are used in relation to industrial decarbonization and the trust and as referred to earlier, that's kind of across the different um, stakeholder networks and they all feed into stakeholder or uh, social license at different scales uh, but kind of the cherry on the top is maintaining that as we said before it is a it's a moving thing and it will need maintaining and uh, kind of keeping an eye on depending on uh, what happens so this is an overview of the project uh, the aims were to assess and develop conditions for establishing and maintaining a strong social license uh, for decarbonizing in the clusters and we want to extend that to the technologies that are involved in the projects. Um, so yeah, firstly, technology is also projects. Uh, and then we're looking at kind of a cluster scale, but then thinking about things nationally. Um, so lessons that can be learned from one cluster and applied to uh, the other clusters. And as part of that, we involved a, an iterative process of mapping and deliberation uh, to try and uh, identify key factors that affect the social license to operate. Uh, so you can kind of see an overview of that process there. Uh, we started with a, our first engagement with a, was a stakeholder workshop held in February last year. Um, and we produced a report as part of that, which we've got a link to at the end. Um, we held focus groups. So they were with the UK public in uh, specifically around the, the two clusters that we're studying, again, the Northwest and the Humber. Um, again, we had a, a report from that. And then we fed that back to our stakeholders uh, just quite recently in, um, in this month. And we will have a, uh, a report from that. So some of the outputs from that. So firstly, the first stakeholder workshop that we held uh, in February last year. Um, 
that identified some of the kind of key strengths that the um, clusters identified. So this is from the stakeholders. They identified the key strengths being the kind of physical infrastructure, access to salt caverns, access to off offshore storage, uh, a strong industrial heritage in the region, and a common shared vi vision um, within that. So I guess that's kind of fundamentally part of uh, forming a cluster. You kind of uh, need those things, I guess. Um, some challenges were identified around the kind of availability of a skilled workforce, especially kind of competing with other UK projects and uh, a potential lack of UK uh, policy and urgency from government and kind of giving clarity to our uh, professional stakeholders there. In terms of difference between the clusters, we saw um, the Northwest cluster suggests they had a strong industrial uh, desire to decarbonize, uh, but potentially a challenge with, uh, with building um, public understanding in that region. Um, and that goes back to your kind of historic events there, uh, potentially fracking being referenced. And in terms of the Humber, they didn't talk, talk about that too much, but were a bit more concerned about uh, the business models and providing support and regulation for hydrogen and CO2 as these cluster pl plans develop. Um, then we did a trust exercise with them. We were trying to pull out some of the kind of key things that were affecting trust um, across the, the stakeholder networks and party politics was important in that. I think at that time, um, Partygate was uh, very relevant in the news. Thought we'd got past that, but it's back again. Um, local institutions were very important for kind of building these networks and these partnerships. So that can be the LEPs or the local governments uh, around these regions. Power to influence is also important. I guess that was uh, related to kind of NGOs who were trusted, but potentially don't quite have the kind of power to influence things um, it was perceived, uh, whereas government might might be a bit um, different to that. And then kind of some mentions of the, the perceived uh, motivations, and that was particularly linked to industry. Um, and it was a similar sort of time of the year, so kind of uh, oil and gas companies were releasing their, their, their profits and uh, that was perceived to be affecting kind of public trust in those in those industries, particularly oil and gas. So this work kind of uh, relates to some work done by government. Um, so the Bayes did a, had a public dialogue on CCUS in uh, 2021 to examine systems attitudes towards CCUS. And as part of that, they kind of developed this uh, list of 10 criteria that were important for the kind of implementation of CCUS, so the development of these clusters. Uh, safety was an important part of that. Uh, you can see the other nine things there, that, that, and they all kind of map quite nicely to our kind of credibility, legitimacy, and um, trust. Uh, so just thought I'd kind of put that in there as kind of a relation to, to some work that you might be familiar with. In terms of more results from our work, um, we had focus groups. These were with um, just nine people in each cluster region. Um, it's very different to David's work is we're kind of trying to just have a, a select group of people and um, try to kind of educate or not educate them, but uh, give them a bit of an understanding of what the technologies are, uh, the, the projects that are being planned in their region, region, then trying to understand what they think about those plans. Um, so, yeah, just nine people. Um, it's a small select group, but it does kind of map quite nicely to kind of some of the other work that's um, that's happened in the literature. Um, we did exclude some people, so that was people that were directly involved or employed by those industries, um, or people that were kind of part of climate action groups. Um, we were more looking for the kind of general kind of population in those regions. Um, and as part of that, they weren't particularly familiar with climate change or net zero, or those plans. So we kind of went through a process. This is a little overview of, um, of what we took them through. So firstly, introducing climate change, introducing net zero, the role of industry in that, um, and then getting onto a bit more detail around CCS and hydrogen um, to kind of explore their views on those. And you can kind of see down the right here, the kind of list of polls that we examined. So firstly, we asked if, if they were kind of concerned about climate change, people were concerned. Uh, had they heard of net zero? Uh, surprisingly, people weren't too familiar with the term net zero. Um, and then we talked about um, industrial decarbonization they kind of agreed with from what we'd presented that it was important to decarbonize industry. Um, we took them through a, a word, kind of what, what three words come to mind when you when you think about CCS and I'll present those a little bit. And then we finished with a, a workshop report, which was their opportunity to kind of 
um, feed into the stakeholders, uh, the, our next stakeholder workshop, what they thought were their uh, key questions and what they thought about the plans. Um, so we've used that to kind of inform our stakeholders and uh, presented that work to um, Desnes and those sorts of things. This is a little uh, example of one of those. So this is from the Northwest because I've tried to be equal and give an example from each. This is from the Northwest. We asked, uh, what do you think about the industrial uh, decarbonization plans? And they had some key points around uh, communication. They, um, the kind of interesting finding about this is that no one had heard of the cluster plans in the regions, uh, but they liked them when they'd heard about them. Uh, the fact that they hadn't heard about them kind of raised a bit of suspicion, which was um, quite interesting. They were kind of like, oh, I like this. And then after a while, they're like, wait, why haven't we heard of this? Um, and that kind of uh, raised some suspicion. Uh, they wanted to hear more. They wanted to hear more on the details. So they had questions around kind of uh, CO2 storage and CO2 leakage, and they wanted to see some sort of data and evidence around that. Um, and yeah, they questioned why they hadn't heard about it, and mentions were you know mentions were made to to HS2 why we're hearing about HS2, but we haven't heard about this, which we really want to hear about. Um, impacts on the local area were brought up. That was in relation to jobs and the environment, um, and some mentions of kind of uh, traffic and that sort of thing. Um, costs and also kind of hydrogen and uh, its, its explosivity. I think that was due to someone kind of Googling hydrogen as part of as part of the uh, focus group and kind of was saying, oh, look, um, you know, fr from Google, what does it tell you about hydrogen? It's kind of interesting that that's, that's how people get their information. Um, so I think that's interesting. And then we all, uh, offer them the opportunity to, to ask their questions and, and you can see those um, written there. I won't go through those. Um, a few examples of, of what the Humber cluster talks about. Um, so they identified the kind of the jobs, uh, starting at the top right. Uh, they said it's a, you know it's a, it's a real struggle. There's a massive skills gap there. Skills gap there. Uh, so I think having grads and, uh, and apprenticeships would be would be important. So they wanted to make sure that the government were identifying that um, training needed to be in place in in order to kind of provide the jobs to local people rather than uh, people that were. Um, coming overseas to just deliver these projects and then um, maybe go elsewhere. So they wanted the local benefits. Um, so they also picked up on the, in, in this cluster, particularly the kind of um, storage of CO2. So they said uh, the worst case scenario, as far as I'm concerned, is that CO2 gets into the North Sea and uh, they were worried about what happens to it then, what happens to, it to, to the marine life there. Um, and they did identify that in, the industries are important, important for keeping the jobs that go with them. Um, so they, they didn't want the industries to be kind of demonized, um, but uh, they, they understood that that is sometimes what happens. Uh, but interestingly, the bottom point is in relation to hydrogen. And they suggested that uh, if you don't have to store the CO2, then that's obviously got to be the preferable answer. Um, that was in relation to, to green uh, preference for green hydrogen over blue hydrogen. Um, so yeah, that, that's coming back to kind of your, your CO2 storage issues. Uh, in terms of some common themes, um, there was a common, common kind of need to act on climate change. Um, they liked the plans, though they did have questions around why they hadn't heard of it. So they wanted more transparency, more data. Um, the kind of key concerns were kind of cost and the, the safety and infrastructure proximity. Uh, there were some questions around the kind of time scale. Would it be ready in time? Um, how long before the benefits uh, are seen? You know, is it happening too quickly versus is it happening too slowly? And uh, issues around the governance and the local impacts that I've touched on already, I think, around jobs. Uh, so just to summarize the kind of over overview of um, what we've what we found from the projects um, is that work, from working with the stakeholders, uh, there's kind of a strong social license, um, but kind of wider public support is is not as yet established. Um, so there was there was support for the need to act on climate change, um, but potentially kind of a bit more information around the jobs and uh, kind of leadership from the government. Um, and they wanted transparency in the kind of uh, contract awarding process. They didn't, didn't quite understand how um, some some clusters would be selected, uh, but others uh, wouldn't. And they wanted some clarity around why those clusters uh, were being selected. Um, and then from the recent kind of stakeholder engagement, there were kind of concerns from the UK government policy uh, that it might have been kind of left behind from a, a strong point. Uh, we kind of asked what a change in the last year. They suggested that kind of the UK was potentially in a weaker place compared to to the last year internet in the international context that might be changing um, with the recent announcements so um, we will keep an eye on that um, very little awareness of the cluster plan so people wanted to to know more 
Uh, I think you've touched on that and, and kind of it's quite interesting that it's not currently in the national dialogue. Uh, people aren't talking about this too much. Um, uh, so it's, it's how we tackle that. And we'll be kind of bringing this work forward uh, to try and signpost some of the, the opportunities for improving uh, those three things that are mentioned. Thanks very much. There are the uh, publications uh, that reference to and a uh, little QR code if you fancy scanning our report. All right, thank you very much, Damid. Um, any any questions for Damid on his work? Um, yeah, David. Yeah, I mean, just your, your point about the difference between the high net kind of more public concern. I mean, I guess you traced it arguably to fire fracking, but you know, would there be reasons why we aren't seeing this in on the East Coast as much? Yeah, I mean, um, fracking seems to be quite quite an important part of that, I would say. Uh, there's also talk about, um, yeah, fr fracking seems to be an important part of uh, why these kind of networks are already developed, I, th I think, and the kind of like that historical context there. Um, what also feeds into it is this kind of there's a hydrogen village competition uh, as well. So the, the, this plan to kind of convert a, a village um, to to kind of solely hydrogen use um, within the UK. That's uh, and the base has base has plans to announce that later in the year, and that seems to have a, a bit of a relation. Or we've definitely seen some people that objected to the kind of fracking uh, debate that kind of have moved on to that, and the, the worry is that that then might shift onto onto INET. So far, it's kind of been separated as they're different. It's hydrogen for homes and hydrogen for industry, um, but it might. There's a bit of a risk there. Feeds into it. Uh, yeah, Luke. I uh, Luke Bailey from uh, Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. Um, yeah, I had a question around. I suppose you, you talked about the the people wanting greater visibility. Um, in terms of who should be providing that greater visibility, do you have any thoughts on, I suppose you can think specific to the high net plans, but also I suppose CCUS as a technology more general, um, who do you think is best placed uh, to provide that visibility in a, in a trusted manner? Um, a very good question. We had that come up quite a lot from our industrial stakeholders who felt they weren't necessarily the right people or or there was an attachment you know around that trust thing of um they can put pieces out there and they, they might be kind of key communicators in these cluster plans um but people will have attached kind of perceptions of of the the brand that that they've created um so yeah we, we touched on that the kind of academics were were mentioned as like a, a trusted party in this but they're not necessarily the people that might might go out there and be promoting, you know, or making a conscious effort to prom promote it, but they would be trusted. Um, so, yeah, I think essentially it's kind of independent bodies. If those, uh, where those come from, is another another matter. Um, government was mentioned, but um, David's already already talked about, you know, kind of uh, whether 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 the government should be kind of active about kind of promoting these sorts of things is, uh, I don't know, may, maybe not seem to be be too, too ideal um but potentially government or independent bodies i'd say yeah, just a second wait, wait for the mic for people online just to follow up on that slightly would that be could that be any academics you know on tv as such or do people more so trust like their local like universities in the high net region and academics from that region or is is the reverse true I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I think it, we we kind of touched on academia in general, I guess. So, so they just kind of identified it as a sector that would be trusted. Um, but also as part of that, there's kind of key people that they, uh, you know, uh, TV personalities that, that that would be trusted. You know, Brian Cox and uh, David Attenborough were mentioned quite a lot. Um, I don't, don't think that they're quite the right people to speak on industrial decarbonisation, but. Uh, there was a lot of looking for a similar sort of personality. Guy Martin has recently done a documentary um, on Channel Four around powering Britain. I think and that, that that was mentioned quite a bit for the for the Humber region. Okay. 
Hello, um, Lee Mills from Natural Resources Wales. Um, is there any plans to expand this into, say, the South Wales Industrial Cluster? Do a similar study there? There's a current, there's, there's not plans at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, it's getting funding, I guess. <laughs> well, but you support us. Um, yeah, so let, let me. Uh, let me thank uh, David one more time and a quick round of applause, and we'll move to our our next uh, next speaker. So our next speaker is Emily Cox. Uh, she's a researcher at the universities of Oxford and Cardiff, so both, uh, and she's a social scientist in energy and climate, with expertise in public attitudes and behaviors, risk, resilience, and socio technical systems. And uh, she has a PhD. I suppose she worked as a lecturer in psychology at Cardiff University and taught energy policy at the University of Sussex, and I'll let her introduce her research. All right, the floor's yours. Okay, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, what great session to be in. I'm in, I'm in great company up here, right? Um, so I, this is, um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit more specific that I think could really affect public perceptions of CCS. And this is partly a shameless plug for my most recent paper, right? Because this is what we've been looking at. We've been looking at this idea of spillover from controversies on other technologies. Now, I've already heard fracking be mentioned several times at this conference. And so this is a picture of my personal favorite technology controversy, um, which was the, the fracking controversy in the UK, which I'm sure you're all aware of. The point I want to make here, I guess, is that this idea of controversy or negative perceptions spilling over to impact other sectors is often mentioned, it's often kind of almost mentioned in passing, but there really wasn't any empirical work on this, right? There wasn't any kind of um, data out there to show how this works in practice or the extent of this feeling and, and how it could impact other techniques. So the hypothesis is fairly simple, right? We know that energy systems are fundamentally interconnected. We did work back in 2019 showing that policy decisions in one arena often impact other technologies and other sectors. We also know from the psychology research that when people are forming opinions about an unknown risk, so something they might be less familiar with, like CCS, as David showed, then people draw on knowledge of more familiar risks. And so the hypothesis is that the fracking controversy impacted public perceptions of other energy technologies. Um, my colleague Steve Westlake kind of pointed out to us that it might be a little bit more nuanced than this, right? That perception spillover can actually act in different ways, depending on the person or group and their means of kind of receiving or uh, digesting information. And so we came up with this kind of three-way typology. So. First of all, you've got the spontaneous one, right? So this is where the person already has a kind of opinion about the controversial technique, and they make an immediate association between the novel technology such as CCS and the controversial one without being prompted. Then we've got the prompted version. And so this is when after the controversy is mentioned, then the association is made based on the pre-existing opinions that that person might have. And that prompting could come from um, social media, traditional media. It could come from someone else in their community, someone um, someone else in a, in a research group, for example. And then finally, we've got what we call primed spillover. And I think this is slightly less relevant to fracking because this mainly operates in situations where the person is unfamiliar with the controversy. And this is where um, detailed information is actually provided. Now, in the case of fracking, we find that it's sort of upwards of 80% are aware of the technology, they're aware of the controversy. So this primed thing is gonna be a smaller percentage of the sample, right? And so we tested this um, in the UK. Um, we did, so Dave, David's talked about survey work. Dermot's talked about um, qualitative work using small groups. They both have their own unique advantages and disadvantages. So we generally do both and we kind of triangulate between them, right? Um, and so what we wanted to do was we wanted to test the extent of this. And so we tested one technology which we thought was kind of pretty similar to fracking and for that we chose deep geothermal energy for this study 
and we chose one that we thought was kind of quite dissimilar to fracking, which is actually harder than you'd think to come up with a novel energy technology that fell into that category. But we landed on green hydrogen. Now, hydrogen's already been mentioned a couple of times at this conference, but we were looking at electrolysis from renewables without CCS and without any underground storage of the hydrogen. That's kind of important. So um, unsurprisingly to us, 87% of respondents were opposed to fracking. This is in line with uh, government statistics. What really did surprise us is that fracking was mentioned like within a minute or so, right? It immediately came up um, and we had to kind of, you know, reassess our whole research design on the basis of how much that surprised us, right? We found that people's attitude to fracking was the most significant predictor out of all of the variables that we put into our model. It was the most significant predictor of attitudes towards deep geothermal energy. And importantly for CCS, we find that spillover seems to mainly influence opinions of technologies with similar methods. And in our particular case, this was drilling and pumping anything underground, right? And the reason that we can say this is because of the inclusion of quite a lot of qualitative data in our work, right? This qualitative data enables us to ask questions about why people feel this way rather than just, you know, how they feel. And I think the important point I want to make here is in our survey, it was nearly half of the sample who, when prompted to think of fracking by, um, by the survey itself, um, uh, their opinions about geothermal became more negative at that point. And so what this means in the real world is that as soon as fracking is mentioned or as soon as fracking is prompted by anyone anywhere, then you've got 45% of people who are going to become more negative about your technique if they think it's similar, right? As a kind of an aside, I'm not talking about hydrogen in this presentation, but we found that 14.5% felt more positive about green hydrogen because of what they perceived as its dissimilarity to fracking, right? So um, just some kind of key findings um, in relation to um, CCS in particular. So we did some previous work where we found that perceptions of carbon removal were connected to concerns about fracking. That was small sample work. It was deliberative. It was very exploratory, which is why we went out to do this much more kind of rigorous um, survey testing. Right? We found that the strongest concerns were around storage underground. For any of you working on carbon removal, uh, we were looking at bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS, and direct and air capture with, car with storage, or DACs. Importantly, there we found that these concerns were linked to a loss of trust in the actors involved and a lack of trust in expert assurances in the safety and efficacy of carbon removal, right? So where you've got these kind of experts saying, oh yeah, but you know, we can assure you it's been, it's been tested, it's safe and so on and so forth. There was a widespread perception of, oh, but they kind of said that with fracking and then they stopped it because of earthquakes. And so therefore they said fracking was safe and it turned out it wasn't. So now you're saying this is safe. How can you give us those assurances, right? And um, this is a plug for Claire Goff's paper, who's actually not uh, not here, but I think that that 2018 paper by Goff et al. is really important in this space. And they found that a breach of trust in Lancashire negatively impacted people's perceptions of CCS and issues with fracking licenses had a big impact on the discussions there. But in Teesside, the people they spoke to focused mainly on economic benefits of CCS and expressed pride in their um, industrial past. However, that data was collected in 2015, right? And since then, we know from survey data that the opposition to fracking and the fracking controversy really spread across the country and, and spilled over uh, spatially, if you like, um, until it was the point where basically there was no difference between different regions um, in how much they were opposed to fracking. I think something that's quite important, though, is that many studies find what we call conditional acceptance of carbon capture and storage. And this is quite common across novel energy techniques, is that it's not kind of an outright rejection. It's more like, oh, OK, well, maybe as long as we get the conditions right, as long as it's done in the right way. 
And we found that this holds true even in the face of strong spillover effects. Um, just a little bit more on the kind of spontaneous and prompted spillover that I mentioned previously. Um, so as I've already said, these comparisons were linked to similarities in the techniques used. Um, really crucially, fracking was being used as an example of unpredictable risks with the deep underground. And this paper by Partridge et al, my, my old colleague, um, Merrin Thomas, they did some work on uh, narratives of the subsurface, right, which is a great paper and a highly recommended reading if anyone's interested in this stuff. They found that the underground was seen as unknowable. Um, it was seen as kind of an obscure environment. It was seen as a place where it's very, very challenging um, to predict and control and reverse potential unintended consequences. Interestingly, they found that it also kind of contains this like intrinsic threat. So it's not like some other environments that might be perceived as vulnerable and in need of protection. It's more like if we mess with it, it might come back to bite us. Right? So uh, just to conclude, so we find evidence that fracking has had a lasting impact on public perceptions of other energy technologies in the UK. And we find that spinover seems to mainly influence opinions of technologies with similar methods, uh, i.e. drilling and pumping underground. We also find that perception spillover is multifaceted and it arises in different ways, depending on the individual or the group and their means of receiving and seeking information. We find some evidence of kind of latent or underlying associations. And from this, we basically argue that attempting to ignore or downplay similarities might run a risk of backfire. However, the good news is that despite the spillover, we find a lot of conditional acceptance of novel energy technologies. Therefore, we argue that rather than trying to kind of downplay these similarities and risking this backfire, it might actually be more fruitful to try and kind of understand the necessary conditions that people would like to see in place. But we also find that such conditions might be pretty stringent. And in a lot of cases, they will be directly related to the conditions which fracking was perceived to have failed to meet, if that makes sense. Um, we made some policy recommendations. These are available at the UK um, Unconventional Hydrocarbons website. Um, the first one is just to take the lessons from the fracking controversy seriously. We learned a lot from the fracking controversy, so let's not repeat those errors. These are things like procedural justice, including people in decision processes on issues that affect them. Uh, place technology fit, which is theories going back many, many years, the right technology in the right place, pay attention to social and landscape context, and distributional aspects. So this is how risks and benefits are distributed, who wins, who loses, who is it all for. And just as a, an aside, it's worth noting that in the case of fracking, the community benefits were kind of widely perceived as bribes and they didn't go down particularly well. Um, I've already mentioned getting the conditions right, and I think that point from the uh, science-wise CCUS slide that you showed was, was really good because that, again, takes us some way towards understanding what the necessary conditions might be. In the case of geothermal and, and in our work on carbon removal and carbon capture and storage, actually, we find that something that's really important is the perception of a general transition away from fossil fuels. And this is what really differentiated these novel energy technologies from fracking, which was widely disliked. Um, transparency of decision making kind of comes back to the procedural justice point, also solid mechanisms for public participation and um, well understood and well regulated uh, monitoring and control systems, but I'm not an expert in monitoring so please don't ask me technical questions on that. Um, and then finally, uh, just committing to coherent policy narratives I think there's a real temptation to try and sort of communicate around perception spillover we argue that it would be better to openly acknowledge and try and move past it. For example, by supporting a climate knowledge, a climate policy narrative, which commits to the phase out of fossil fuels. And that in turn could potentially help to avoid these perceptions that CCS is like a non-transition. So uh, yeah, I'll wrap up, thank you. All right, thank you, Emily. Um... I guess it's don't mention the F word, yeah, forget. <laughs>
Um, next question here. Hi there, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, Chris, uh, Christy Calvillo from uh, University of Strathclyde. I found this all stuff very, very uh, interesting and, and very important for the whole narrative of developing new technologies that you need to develop in order to get to net zero. This takes the point of view of a negative perception, and but I don't know if you have seen the same type of spillover happens with a positive light, like, I don't know, moving from offshore wind that has been very good to maybe other type of marine energies. I don't know if you have analyzed anything like that. And um, yeah, absolutely. And that was the kind of aside I made about hydrogen. So we kind of, even though we started out thinking, right, we're mainly interested in negative spillover, we then kind of thought, well, hold on, why couldn't it operate in the other direction? Why couldn't we have this kind of positive spillover? And that's exactly what we saw for green hydrogen. It was a much smaller percentage of people, and we didn't find any any spontaneous um, positive spillover. There wasn't any. And, it, you know, it, it was it was definitely less the evidence was less strong for the existence of that positive spillover, but it was there. And um, yeah, and it really came down to this kind of perceived complete dissimilarity between fracking and, and green hydrogen. Of course, if we'd included a like underground storage aspect of the hydrogen or if we'd been looking at blue hydrogen or something, it probably would have been would have been very different. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions for me? Yeah, uh, Luke and then David. Yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I suppose it's just a bit of a reflection, kind of a question as well. Um, I think like in the, the CCS space from the government's perspective, one of the things that I found myself saying today, and I think it was quite subconsciously, is um, we always talk about how the, the business models and all that stuff we've created are designed on the um, contracts for different scheme because that's been a successful scheme. And we also also tend to refer to offshore wind quite a lot in a way. So in some ways, we're possibly trying to do some of the positive spillover in that way, even though it's not, I don't think it's particularly intended in that respect. So, um, but um, yeah, I suppose it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, I suppose, how we could, um, uh, I suppose try to use some more like positive spillover in the sort of community in the way we communicate uh, the CCS program. Um, yeah. Yeah, two two parts to that. I mean, um, so 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 there was some work on this in the context of BEX actually looking at policy mechanisms, and it certainly is something that we want to do more of in future because, like, we always look at these sort of generic public perceptions right but it's really important how these technologies are incentivized because that's part of the whole kind of socio-technical landscape right and so yeah looking at them in policy context is something we want to do more in future what that previous work actually found was that it was the direct payments that were problematic and that was because of Hinkley C and so basically people made a connection between the what was what was seen as too much money being paid to Hinkley C. And then that then impacted the way they responded to the same kind of uh, incentivization for Bex. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's the one point. And then I guess the other point is just what I kind of said at the end. It's like in in a situation where you do have underlying associations and where you do have latent associations, communication is it can maybe only get you so far you can't necessarily communicate around the problem and expect the problem not to exist right I think there's a certain element of having to sort of um yeah confront these confront these similarities head on and 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 be explicit about how we're making sure that the same kind of things doesn't happen again right and so yeah, I, I'm, I'm all. I'm a bit cautious about saying like, oh yeah, just talk about it like it's the same as on as offshore wind, and and it'll be fine. Like we know offshore wind's got very high support. We know that renewables have got very high support. We know that if there's a kind of perceived, as I said, like general portfolio of genuinely moving past fossil fuels, we know from so much data that this is likely to be quite positive, right? So. Yeah, it's a bit bit of a bit of a nuanced response to that, I guess. Can David? Um, yeah, thanks, Emily. Great uh, as usual. Um, so um, you're essentially talking about relative changes, but you didn't really talk about absolute level either in terms of 
kind of the assessment of geothermal energy or just how big it is, right? Because you could imagine if something is, you know, uh, six out of seven and you get to half point off because of association with fracking, well, that's, it's still fine. And, and, and so I guess I wonder how, you know, how important is kind of the, the absolute side of it? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, we did. We did look at that. And I can't actually remember what the numbers were. I mean, as you'd predict, it was mostly don't knows, right? It was mostly like, yeah, I don't know, never heard of it. Like, I just uh, maybe I don't know, I need to know more. It was, it was mostly that kind of like, can you give me some more information? And then I might be able to answer your question kind of thing. But yeah, I, I, can't, I can't remember that. I can't remember the absolute numbers, I'm afraid. I know that people were yeah you're right people were more negative about deep geothermal but then the kind of relative change that we saw of that kind of 45 percent was like yeah it was uh, it was big enough to be impactful despite the geothermal being more disliked I think I don't know I'll have to dig out the numbers for you if you're interested and uh, I guess our final question and uh can all uh, disappear Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the spillover. And you you mentioned um, underground environments and how that can cause spillover between fracking and CCS. But is there also, um, do you get spillover in terms of like the complexity element? And so do the public kind of feel that, you know, there were multiple elements to fracking that they didn't understand? And therefore, kind of the wool could be pulled over their eyes a little bit. And the same, could the same be said for some elements of CCS? And so um, you can have spillover in terms of this is another complex um, proposal where there are multiple elements that we don't understand. And this is a bit of over information, really, but I was at a comedy gig the Friday before last and someone asked me, I was on the front row and someone said, what do you do? And I explained I work on carbon capture and 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 I explained he said well what's that and I explained it out a little bit and it was m not very funny and um and then he said oh so what does what does carbon look like then underground and I thought like there's there are the more you try and help people understand there's more and more questions that maybe don't apply when you say like uh we're going to generate energy from the wind and people can sort of it's a little bit more tangible Also, there's a lot of parts to that question, right? I think there's a slight difference between complexity and tangibility. I think that if you asked, and I, I'm kind of, I, we didn't ask about this specifically, but from the from all of the qualitative data that we have for that about fracking, I don't think people saying, oh, but it's just there's too many parts of the system and it's too complex. We don't understand it. I don't think that comes up particularly. It's more to do with this. Um, yeah, it's it's not tangible. It's the underground. Right. And that that kind of then feeds into a kind of general feeling that if you don't know, you know, how can you see what's going on there? And so if there is like a well casing crack or something like that, how easy is it to actually identify that that's happened, right? And so I don't think it's due to the complexity of the techniques per se. That said, you know, we do find what we do find that, you know, how um, kind of intuitive something is seen to be plays a massive role, right? And so if, for example, you're talking about removing carbon using using biomass versus removing carbon using bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage, you're often going to hear like, well, you know, surely just do it with a tree, right? Like it's it's intuitive, you know, it kind of rather than these like extra steps that you've got added on. So, yeah, I'm not going to say it doesn't play a role, but I don't think that the complexity of the system itself is what's necessarily driving opposition to fracking. Therefore, if it's not driving the opposition to fracking, I don't see why it would be driving the opposition, the, the spillover effect, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. One just very specific approach we took, or we kind of 
change we're trying to do more recently is when we're showing graphics of what a carbon capture kind of chain looks like is to better represent the storage and so not to have a big graphic of a power station and then a very short pipe going into underground storage but it's instead explain how far through through the imagery how far underground it goes because as you say it's not tangible and if people think that it's only going like a couple of meters because that's what our graphics are portraying then it can create some confusion we found that the deeper it goes the more risky it's perceived to be and so we saw this a lot with fracking. They were like, oh, well, the reason people are against it is because these graphics aren't accurately illustrating how deep it goes, you know, and, and they're correct. Like those graphics were inaccurate. And then, you know, we saw ones coming out where you've got all of the different layers and everything like that. What we actually found was that, and, and it's, you know, it, perfectly reasonably people think, oh, well, if it's right underneath people's houses, then that's going to be more of a problem. We actually saw that people were far more favorable toward the idea of shallow geothermal. Um, we didn't know from our data precisely where shallow becomes deep. And obviously the regulation also doesn't particularly know exactly where shallow becomes deep, right? It's not a, it's not a clear cut thing. But it's definitely these concerns about, yeah, these concerns about kind of messing with an unknown environment, the concerns about controllability and reversibility seem to increase the deeper your drill goes, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of our it was one of our further research. Can we have some money to look at this things in our paper? All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, please join me in uh, giving a big round of applause to Emily and uh, 